All right, good morning, everyone. Let's talk about our uh, little schedule that we have. If you want to get that out first, a little half sheet. Um, one thing I need you to add as we're looking through that is uh, yesterday we talked about, or the other day, about lab safety. Today we're doing a lecture, uh, and then we're going to continue that. Next week, though, we have a couple little uh, activities. One is a uh, lab vet, which you have zero responsibility beforehand. You just have to show up, and you have to sh uh, do a couple real simple lab uh, procedures and we stamp you off and it's really good to go. But Friday, we have a really great lab called the Alchemy Lab and you need to bring something in. Uh, you don't usually get to have a souvenir, but you get one out of this lab hopefully. So I have it up on the screen uh, on that 10-5, uh, which is that Thursday, assigning you three to five shiny pennies that you need to bring in. And if you don't want to write them both, for surely on that Friday, 10-6, do please jot that down and we're going to try to remind you. but. Now you can't do the lab without pennies. And this isn't to supplement our retirement or anything else like that. You want to have these. You get to take something home with you. Uh, we're going to do some stuff with pennies that are pretty sweet. Uh, and if you don't have them, it doesn't work. They should be as shiny as possible. Uh, so try to make that happen. If not, hopefully you have a friend who has uh, pennies as well. Or else it's going to be an issue. Okay? So it should be a lot of fun. Okay, uh, besides that, then we have a little safety quiz that's really low key. You just have to pass it. If you don't, you just got to come back in. Uh, if you make a couple mistakes on it, we'll, we'll figure that out. And then on that Thursday, it's a shortened class. We just have a little lab quiz. So it'll be on stuff about safety potentially. It'll be on things I'm talking about now. It's on things that we'll be talking about next lecture, a uh, big, uh, large group. And then um, we'll, we'll take that and get you right to Spirit Day. Very nice. If you didn't know that's how close we are. All right, I know, we're all waiting. Uh, all right, so you should have a note sheet uh, that we gave you today. It's called Chem Terms. Uh, there are a lot of our things already written on there. You are welcome. Uh, usually all those definitions you have to write. I want to focus more on the big nuggets and the examples so you can kind of keep it clear. So it should say Chem Terms right on top with a bunch of things that say verses in the middle. That's what we are writing on. So if you want to have that out and ready to go, uh, we are going to get started. Okay, so um, we need to talk about uh, reactions during this year. And we're going to talk about chemistry. And the root of it all is that chemistry produces something that's new. Something new was made. If not, it's not chemistry. So what we need to do is understand what is interacting with chemistry. So it all starts at matter. And you've probably done this before in middle school, talked a little bit about matter, and that's fine. It's good. Uh, but we're going to go a lot deeper today. Uh, so matter. What is matter? You don't need to write this part down. I guess my question just would be, if we do a couple th different things, like um, if I do like time, and I do ice, and I do energy, and I do air, let's say. Those are four things that we're all kind of familiar with. Would that count as matter or not? Well, here's the issue, is if it was in a chemical reaction, could it react? Could it actually interact with other things? Only matter can actually interact with other pieces of matter and create something new. Now, we're not creating something out of nothing. It already has to be present, but can we make a new compound uh, somehow? So the only definition you have to write today, I think, is the one that we're going to write on top, matter. Uh, matter is anything that has mass and volume. Okay, so if you're already looking at that, like, well, I'm not sure if time or ice or energy or air do both of those things. Well, if you're not sure what those two things are, let's make it real simple. It's not a big deal writing this down, but mass is really how much stuff you have. I know, it's a real complicated definition, but it's how much stuff you have. So, like, when they say you go up to the moon and you weigh less, right? Well, it's not like you have less stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, where's my left arm? Like, it's not like that happened. You have the same amount of stuff. So weight isn't necessarily the same thing as mass. And if you take physics from Mr. Blackford, he'll describe and talk to you all about that kind of stuff. Volume is takes up space. So for something to react, it needs to have stuff that takes up space. If you don't have stuff that takes up space, it's not matter. So that means that's not part of our reaction. So a great one to talk about, I was like thinking about time. 
It's not like 4 o'clock weighs less or has less mass or takes up less space than 11 o'clock. Like, oh my gosh, it must be getting late because my watch is getting heavy. Uh, it, it doesn't work like that, right? Uh, time is just an idea, and, and we won't get into that, all that, but it, it's, not, it's not a substance. Uh, it can't take up space and it doesn't have any stuff to it. So um, the question I always have, and I'm not going to answer today, is air. Does that actually have mass and take up space? So some of us don't have the same answer to that one. We'll talk about that stuff a little later. All right, so let's continue on. First question is, can it be separated? Okay, so and you don't have to memorize this flowchart per se. You need to know the, the main uh, parts of it all, though. So if you can separate something, if you have uh, a piece of matter. So I brought some orange juice today. Big fan of orange juice. And can this be separated out? Can this be separated? Yeah. In fact, I look at the ingredients. Oh, shoot. It's 100% orange juice. That's not true, though. There's other things in here. So there are multiple compounds in here, or uh, different kinds of maybe atoms, I don't know, or elements. Uh, so it can be separated. So what we call that is a mixture. And you want to make sure that you have the definitions linked to the right ones. I've already given you those definitions, though. But it's made up of more, of more than one element or compound that are not chemically bonded. If it's chemically bonded, then that's one thing. It's like the difference in a, like a minivan, let's say, that's a good example of it. Like the front seat, you're not taking that out. That's bonded to the car. But the middle back seat, you might be able to lift it up, slide it out to be able to haul stuff. Well, then that's not bonded to the car, so that's not part of the car as the other seat might be. Now, I know, again, you're like, well, I can get that out. I'm sure you can. But uh, there's a big difference there. So a mixture, is it uniform? We're going to stay here uh, on this one. Can it be separated? Yes, then it's a mixture. All right, is the composition uniform or not? So that means it's all one thing or not. So I brought a couple things with me. Let's see. Oh. So I brought the orange juice, definitely. Actually, let's talk about that first. Can this be, um, is this all uniform? Anybody? We've all had orange juice. So when I get to the fridge, what do I need to do every time? I should have gotten one that was clear. So you have to shake it, don't you? You have to shake it. Now, you might be uh, oh, so good. You might be confused because it says pulp free on there. That's a lie. That is a vicious lie. There's no such thing as pulp free because I hate pulp. One time my wife bought me, it actually said a whole lot of pulp. I'm like, did you attach divorce papers to the canister as you, as you fed this to me? <laughs> Look like a jack-o'-lantern after you drink it. Uh, I don't like to floss after I drink something. Um, but I brought some, another one of my favorite things. So I brought a vanilla snack pack. <coughs> I don't even know if I can get this open. It won't stop me. So can this, is this all uniform? Is this all uniform right here? Is this all uniform? Yeah, no. <laughs> is that all one thing? Is that all uniform? Did you see any differences? Is there any differences there? Was that all one thing? Looks like all one thing. So that would be a uniform. So here's the difference. If it's all uniform, we call it homogeneous mixture. If it is different, we call it heterogeneous. So homo means the same, hetero means different. Hmm. So I started thinking about that. So I found this snack pack. So I have this snack pack here. And this has chocolate and vanilla. So I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, that chocolate on top, that's definitely homogenous. And that vanilla in the middle, that's kind of homogenous. But when I start going all the way in, when I eat it all, that's so good. That's going to be a heterogeneous <laughs> Because it's, there's different things. So I started thinking about that more and more. So I'm like, well, I really, I love orange juice, but I like to find something that maybe is a little different. So apple juice. You don't have to shake this. I have it all over my face. You don't have to shake apple juice at all. It's all one thing. I haven't shaken this yet today. So that's all one. But it is a mixture of multiple things. So that, again, would be homogenous. Hmm. That's good to do. But I started to ask myself, last question of everything, is that what if... <laughs> 
So I went back to my vanilla snack party. All right? And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, well, you know what? There's some other things that I really like in this world. And one of them is, um, is a Reese's peanut butter cup. Okay? So if you look at, look at a Reese's peanut butter cup, it kind of all looks like one thing. Right? But then I bit into it because I forgot. And I'm like, hey, that's different. So that's clearly, there's differences. So that looks like a heterogeneous mixture. But then I thought, wait a minute. So if I take a homogeneous mixture and heterogeneous mixture and I put them together like this, I put it in my mouth. I'm like, well, we probably still had a reason here. <laughs> so I went further. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I've taken some Hershey's chocolate. And what's this? Hurry before I throw up. <laughs> what is that? Homo it's homogeneous. It's homogeneous. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. If I take the homogeneous candy bar, and I dip it in the homogenous pudding, and I put that in my mouth, where do I got? <laughs> so it's a problem. <laughs> Orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a heterogeneous mixture. So, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. Um, so it, if it looks... Mm. All the same, it's going to be homogenous. If it's different, it's heterogeneous. That's the second time. i got to do this two more times here. Uh, so, here's some examples. <clears throat> Write these down, don't draw them. Uh, milk. Milk is a homogenous mixture. <laughs> it used to not be until they pasteurized it. And now it's all one thing. If you have to go shake your milk, and, oh, we shake our milk at home. Throw it away. <laughs> we like to do things old school. Now Gatorade, that's salt water. I will ruin Gatorade for you and then you'll forget. Next time you drink a Gatorade or anything like that, think salt as you're drinking it. And you will taste it. It's just sweet and salt water. Again, you need these examples, so you should be writing this below. I don't see a lot of people writing these. So milk, Gatorade, and the last one is apple juice. Those are all homogenous mixtures. Another example. Eggs. They're all different. Orange juice. There's differences. And that's a salad. So, usually this is pretty clear. If it separates, so that's the biggest deal. If it separates, um, then you know that's a heterogeneous mixture. Okay? So the, the big word, actually, to me, is a solution. If it's a solution, it's a homogenous mixture. So make sure you do understand where, which one goes to which. Okay? All right, let's go to the other side. Don't worry. I, maybe you're hoping. There, I can't eat. And, well, you'll, you'll see why I can't eat any of this. If you can't separate it, what we consider that is a pure substance. It's harder to find pure substances that would be as funny. So that's matter with constant composition and distinct properties. They're, they're always the same all the time. Can it be decomposed by ordinary chemical means? Meaning that, can you break it apart further? So if it was pure, be like, wait, how can you break it apart? Well, if it's made up of, of a couple different kinds of things, but I could break it apart, but it, when it's together, it's always the same. Well, that is called a compound. And what is going on? Oh. I'm going to have to move that in a second. As two more elements chemically bonded to form more than one substance. So uh, an example of that would be uh, sugar. Great example. Another one. Instead of writing water, I'd actually write this. H2O. Oh, wait. It's two elements. But it's always H2O. It's not like, oh, we have really good water. We have H3O. It's so much better. Always H2O. So that's a pure substance. We have salt, which you could write this. NaCl, that's salt, that's table salt. Sodium chloride. If you can't break it up anymore, that means it's already as simple as possible. That's an element. I don't think I sure will use that So I have a couple examples of that. I have carbon, this is charcoal. 
that for your grill, this is gold, and this is a neon sign. You could have oxygen though, like oxygen, I don't have it there, but that would be O2. Well, wait, there's two of them. But it's a simple, it's only one element. If you break it up, it's still just oxygen, it's just an element. It's, we'll get into that later. So, we have elements, compounds, which are pure. We have heterogeneous and homogeneous or homogeneous, and those are mixtures. Okay? So that's going to be kind of our umbrella of talking about some things that are going to react. Let's talk about ways that we can describe reactions. We only have three of them. Um, and talk about how we can describe our products and substances that we are studying. So the first one is change in general. Again, you have all the definitions already there for you. So a physical change is a rearrangement of substances and molecules, but a chemical change results in the formation of a new substance. Please underline new. So I'm going to do some real simple things here, but uh, hopefully you understand kind of what I'm doing. If I do this right now, again, it's got to change its identity. So this isn't complicated. If I just do that, that is a physical change, right? It, it, I just physically ripped it. But we start getting confused when things don't look the same anymore. So for example, I have this. So I have a beaker here, okay? And it's made of glass, right? But if I, oops, if I break it, what is it? It's the glass. Now, it's not gonna hold anything. Mostly down here. But it's still glass. So that is still a physical change. I have to, I have to change the identity of substance. So when we are doing some of the labs and, and looking at our final products, we have to ask ourselves, is it still the same substance? Does it still have the elements bonded the same way? Is it still the same thing? Or is something new created? Which that is what we'll be testing. So um, that is kind of an example of a couple physical changes. Now, if I do this, some of you, I just summoned your dark lord. You're like, yes, burn it. <laughs> I know it. You're like, I'm good. I'm good all day. Okay, go away now. Um, just the end right there, that's not the same anymore, right? It has a different texture maybe, it's a different color. Things have changed. So that is, it would be having a chemical change happen. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of the examples here that I have. So I have like melting ice. I have crushing can, a crushing a can. So two examples for a physical change, a chemical change. I have fire. This was supposed to be digestion. Let's just, let's be real. Whatever we're eating, whenever, whenever we eat the three pudding snack packs, no, whenever we eat anything, uh, it's not the same later, right? Uh, there's chemical reactions going on. The minute actually the food hits your mouth, saliva's starting to change it. It's breaking it down. There's a chemical reaction starting to happen immediately. All right, well, we can describe these changes, and I've already done this for you, you're welcome, with this part at least, through what we call chemical and physical properties. Okay? A, a physical property is any property that is measurable, whose values describe a state of a physical system. The changes in the physical properties of a system can be used to describe its transformations or evolutions between its momentary states. I know there's a lot there, but at the end, physical properties are often referred to as observables. Like, I can observe something. Like, a physical trait of you is your eyes. It's your hair color, it's your height, it's your weight, it's whatever, facial features, anything, right? But I don't know by looking at you what your sense of humor is, right? Uh, how intelligent you might be, all that stuff. That stuff's more internal. So that's where chemical gets kind of confusing. It's like that. Chemical properties, any of the materials properties that becomes evident during or after a chemical reaction. That is, any quality that can be established only by changing the substance's chemical identity. So, I want to talk about that. Go back to this one more time. You're welcome for a few of you. Is that, let's just say you landed on this planet this morning. So now you think that you eat snack packs, for no, like that. No, but besides that, you would not know by looking at this. Like, if I say, give me an observation, you say pink, right? Or something else. But you wouldn't be like, flammable! Like, you wouldn't know it's flammable. Yeah, it's paper, but you wouldn't know. You'd actually have to have it interact. 
Again, there you go. You're welcome. Uh, but let's kill two birds with one stone. Bless you. If I ask this one, does this have the same properties? And I put that underneath there, and you're like, no, that's disappointing. But it can beat out the other one, so there you go. Um, that's not flammable. So a chemical property of the paper is that it's flammable, but of this rod, it is not. So we're going to make a little list, and then I have a really cool demo to show you of a lab safety that deals with this stuff. So more fire coming. Um, let's talk about a couple of physical and chemical properties that you can have. So this is all stemming off of this one. You can do um, mass. You can do color. You can do density. You can do volume. MP and BP, you're going to see that a lot. That's melting point and boiling point. Okay, it's always going to be the same. Like you can observe that. You can just boil it or melt it. And oh yeah, it melts at a zero degrees. Or it's boiling at 100 degrees. So those are physical properties. What's the chemical property? There aren't as many, or as many as we can potentially talk about here. Toxicity. And then, oh, that's toxic. Well, how do you know that berry's toxic unless if you <laughs> interact with it? I just know. Well, let's try it. Okay. Yep, you're right. Uh, you gotta, you gotta have to actually have interaction. So toxicity. We just talked about this one. Flammability. Running out of room. And we'll call it in general chemical stability, but we could also say reactivity. Okay. So I hope you see the difference. Like one of them, you have to have interactions with, and th this is one that students have a lot of challenges with from time to time because you. Get confused, like, oh yeah, I think that's something new. Is it? Is that really new, or does it just look different? Like that glass, it just looks like it's not a beaker anymore. Okay, so I have a pretty cool little demo here. I'm gonna turn off the lights in a second, but I'm gonna explain it to you. So, what I have right here is a liquid. The only observations we can make right now is that it's colorless, right? We could maybe smell it, it has an odor. That, that's about as much as I can really say. I could talk about the volume that it has. I could talk about the mass that it has. But that's about it. Every year, I wish I knew the number. I don't have a number for you. But in America, there are a lot of garage fires that happen, either in business or in a residential garages, that they have fires happen because there are rags in the garage that have certain liquids on them. And then they're doing something else in the garage somewhere else, and a fire starts. Well, how does that happen? Well, in our lab, safety that we've been talking about, and we're going to talk about a little bit more tomorrow, is that you um, can have a flammable liquid not even close to a flame, and you can still start a fire. So it's not like, well, as long as I'm not touching the fire, like you're doing your lab there, and I'm doing it here. I have the liquid, you have the flame. We're good. Problem is, there's vapors coming off. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to light this candle. It's not exciting, that part. I'm going to swirl this around a little bit to try to get some extra vapors evaporating. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the gas. So I'm only going to pour it this much. I'm going to let the gas come out onto the, you're not going to see it, onto the ramp. And you'll see the effect. Okay. I'm going to turn off all the lights so we can see it clearly. <laughs> Actually, I will try to, uh, act, this is what I'm going to do. I need to see a little. I can't see anything. If I, if I can't see anything, what ends up happening is I accidentally pour the liquid <laughs> the liquid down it, and then we got a problem. So I need to be able to see a little bit. Lighting a candle. There we go. Here we go. Glove. Safety first. So you can see, clearly, the vapors are going down the ramp and hitting the flame. And I'm not pouring any liquid. This is just gas. So, oh, that was close. Uh, flammable liquids are dangerous because the vapors are so flammable as well. Yeah. What happens if you let it go up into that? Then it'll just start burning on the top. And then I need a snack pack as it was burning. <laughs> no, it'll just burn on the top, but I, I'd rather not have that happen. Because it's hard to get it out once I got to have to smother it. And I don't really want to use the glove. It's a whole glove smothering, burning thing. 
Are we up? Okay. So, that shows a little bit of what we're doing. Now with that, we're going down to energy, okay? So, before we do that, I want to show something else really cool. So, our nation, sometimes I believe that we are trying to go for lower energy, and then sometimes I'm not sure, like cheaper, less polluting energy. But the problem is, you got to do it in an effective way, right? You got to have people have jobs. Uh, you got to be able to allow uh, people, uh, their families can't be hurt by that. So that all the technology has got to be working and it's got to be profitable. All that matters to our, our, uh, our nation. So um, this is a, a fuel cell, okay? What we have here are two little cells. And in the middle, I just have water, nothing else. This is just water, okay? And in this side, you don't have to draw any of this. Just I want you to take it in. I'm just trying to relate some ideas. I take water and I give it some energy. So this is the light. Okay. What's going to happen? I don't know if you can see this. I think you can. See how the liquid's up on top? There's like liquid up there. Well, the liquid's up there because it got pushed away. The energy went into the cell and the water came down here and then came back out here. You can see. Watch when I push this. I th oh, come on. Maybe this one. See the bubbles? If you didn't, there's bubbles coming out. This one's making oxygen, this one's making hydrogen, and it pushes up, and notice this is higher than this one, because H2O, there's two H's for every O. So this pushed up, the water got pushed away, because the gas is sitting in there. So this is all hydrogen gas now, this is all oxygen. Because water, literally, from that energy, was ripped apart as two gases. Okay? So, we had to put energy in, right? It costs energy, nothing is for free. We had to give it energy. But in this case, maybe we got it from the sun because there's a solar panel on that side. If I didn't show that to you. There's a little solar panel right there. Okay. When I release these tubes, I didn't want to release them yet, I'm going to allow the, the, the gas to come out here and go into this cell. Oh, and then they will recombine and they will come out. So they will recombine and they will come back out water. So if you put energy in, I hope it kind of makes sense that energy would come back out. But it's kind of free energy because we get it from maybe the sun, which we didn't have to do anything about that, and then it will release that energy. And how it will work, so when it's all said and done, so if I just open these up. <laughs> come on, it's neck pack power. Oh, it's already starting. I'm, I'm stopping it right now because it opened up. Here we go. It'll start to run the fan. And what will come out the sides, those two tubes, is just a little bit of water. Your byproduct is water. Wait, but I started with water. Yeah, I did. So I stripped apart, I broke apart the water, and then it went back together, and it created energy. Well, there's energy hidden in bonds. There's energy hidden in bonds all the time. You, you break the bonds, you've got to put energy in to break those. It's like a stick, you've got to break that stick. But when you form an atom again, or elements together, it releases that energy. And that's what's powering that fan. So there's different kinds of flow of energy. And that's what I want to kind of talk about for the second part. Again, we only have two things left. And we got a lot of time left. So you've probably heard these terms before. Exo and endothermic. I don't love the definition of the endothermic, so we're going to add a word. I'm kind of upset about myself with that. But exothermic, it releases. You release energy out. So what I like right now, okay, this class better do well in this because the last class had 70 kids and they were awesome. Okay, you can do this a couple times if you'd like. Um, so, like, have this go in two different directions. Don't open it yet. I'll actually show you before I keep hanging these out. What you're gonna do is you're gonna unscrew this, and you can do it a couple times. I'm gonna have them kind of around the room. Uh, no squirting each other. Okay, no, just, again, we had 70 and that was fine. So, you're gonna put it on your skin, wherever you want. You can spread it out or all in one spot, like two to three drops tops, right? Two. And then blow on it. Blow over it, and figure out how it feels on your skin, okay? Don't worry, it's nothing that's going to hurt you. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. But I'd like you to participate if you can. I'll give you guys one. Okay. This is so much nicer than having you. All right, when you're done, just we'll, we'll pick them up. But put a couple, blow on it. And then let the other person do it. If you want to do it again, that's totally fine. Don't lick it, don't put it in your eyes. 
None of that, okay? Let's keep this real. As you're doing this, please stay with me as well. We can do two things at once, okay? Exothermic, it takes energy in. I'd like you to add a different word to that. I'm annoyed that I didn't do it. I want you to write the word absorbs instead of takes in. Absorbs. Please write that down. Even if we're doing that, the, the liquid. If you don't blow the liquid off in less than three seconds, it is toxic. Did I forget to say that? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm kidding. It's four. Um, so it absorbs energy. All right. So what are we talking about here? When something is releasing energy, it's going out into the environment. So like a thermometer, when you put a thermometer into a solution, the thermometer is the environment. So if something's giving it heat, it's releasing it to the thermometer. So it feels hot. Oh, hold on. You're releasing it. And it gets students confused sometimes because they think, well, wait, but the, the system or the thing we're looking at doesn't have energy anymore. Why is it hot? Because you feel the heat coming off of it. All right? So hopefully you, you already think, well, the other way would be cold. And that's the one that's confusing. That's why I have this going for you right now. Why does that feel cold? We're going to talk about it. And it's actually kind of cool. But here's some of my uh, examples. Uh, a bomb. Right? A bomb would definitely... We need to have examples. So hopefully we're writing the examples as we go. Uh, another one, though. Please write this one down. This is, this is the more important uh, kind of thing to talk about here. We're not always going to be making bombs or anything. Freezing water. We'll get to that in a second. I'll talk about it. Endothermic. An example of that. I don't remember what I did. We have baking. Baking. Now, maybe you're like, I can't bake. Well, then hopefully you would still know this answer, though. I'm baking a cake. I put all the ingredients in. I set it in my counter. I can't come back in an hour or 30 minutes and be like, why didn't it get done? Like, I, I baked. I put it all together. You mixed. Well, that jello stuff or that jello cake, you don't have to do anything with. That's different. Uh, you're not having to put energy into that potentially or something else is happening. Um, another one with that, though. Um, what did I have? Melting ice. Okay. So, we're going to go back up in a second after we declare this. This is really important. So, in chemistry, there are phases. When I say a phase, liquid, solid, gas. So solid, liquid, gas. Those are my phases. So if I talk about freezing water, I hope we all agree that I'm going from a liquid to a solid, right? Okay. And this one, I mean, this isn't rocket science. I'm going from a solid to a liquid. I say that the last hour I flipped and I said, uh, so Here's how this works, and this is where it gets tricky for you. You need to think about it when it's a phase change. First off, if I'm going from a liquid to a solid, freezing water, this was water. Is ice still water? Ice is still water. If I boil something from a liquid to a gas, now you're like, no, that's not water anymore. It's still water vapor. So before I answer this question, come back up here one second with me. In a physical change, this includes not only, but phase changes. So. Mm. Solid to liquid to gas. If anything ever changes, hey, I'm melted butter, I'm, I'm melting ice, I'm boiling water, I'm freezing water, that's always a physical change. It's still water. And most students will mess that up. Okay? So that's not the only kind of physical change. But if you ever have a phase change, automatically physical. Let's come back here. So, why does this make sense? Because I'm a liquid, so I'm a liquid molecule. This is my bad dance here now. I'm a liquid, and now I'm a solid. I've got to slow down. Well, the energy had to release from me. All right, the other way around. I'm a solid, now I'm going to be a liquid. And if I want to be a gas, i got to get more and more energy. So that relates to what you're doing with your hand. And I think this is actually kind of cool. When you get out of the shower, you're cold. Right? When you blew on that, it was cold. It didn't just disappear. Somebody last hour, what, 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 where did, what happened? What's the process? I'm curious what we say. Just now, you blew on it, where'd it go? What, where, what's the process? Evaporation. Someone said absorption. It didn't go in your skin. I have super. Uh, it just, it, it, uh, it evaporated. So it became from a liquid to a gas. Think about this. From a liquid to a gas, it needs to gain energy. So when you get out of the shower, 
why you're cold is that thin layer of water evaporates. Where does it get the energy? From your body heat. It absorbs your body heat and jumps to a gas. When you blew on that, it went from a liquid to a gas. And why it felt cold is because it was literally taking the energy from you. Kind of cool. Well, what process do we know that works really well for us on that? Uh, sweating. And I know some of us say, oh, I hate sweating. And I understand that. But if we didn't do it, we would overheat really fast. Our body pumps a little bit of liquid on the, the surface of our skin. It evaporates and takes the heat with it. That's why it, we cool down and we sweat. So that should make actually a lot of sense. Like, oh yeah, but that's how that works. Okay, so that's why when you're going to something that needs more energy, if you want to make a little note on that, liquid has more energy than a solid, it needs to absorb that energy. Okay, so that is that. Like, I need to absorb that. Okay, last one. And we'll do some homework. So those are some main ideas. Bless you. The last one is ways to describe them. So they're not actually its own entity. So when I see extensive and intensive right away, when I first learned this, I kind of saw what I needed to know. When I see extensive, I think of either like exothermic exiting, or I could think external. So that's what I kind of thought of. Like I kind of think of external. And this is internal. So let's see what we got. It's property that depends on the amount of matter. So your external, uh, the property is dependent on the external amount. Intensive, it's already written there. I hope I put that there. Uh, it does not, basically. There you go. Uh, it doesn't matter. It is constant. It doesn't matter how much you have. So this is the one that students make uh, or have the hardest time with. Maybe because we teach it last and you're already checked out. Sorry, I should have eaten everything later. I don't know. Um, but it, it's one that shouldn't be that tricky. So again, easiest observation is pink, right? It wasn't all saying, oh my god, it's yellow. Like, it's still pink, right? <laughs> Magic. Uh, I should get that one day and have a little piece of paper hidden behind. Like, what? Uh, it's still pink. Does it matter how much I have of it then? No. So this is a color would be an extensive or intensive? Intensive. intensive. Okay, so that's right. We're going to make a list. I'm just one that, I don't think I have any. Do I have stuff hidden? Oh, I do have stuff hidden. Oh, no. I'm afraid to show it now. Let's just write it. I'm afraid to show it. Okay, what's another observation you can make even if you don't know how to quite say it, but something that you would be able to measure or see or whatever? Anything that you know about it. What's one other thing we know about paper? What's another thing we know about it? It's flammable, right? So let's test that, because who doesn't want to see a fire? So if I do this, Versus this, huh, who would have thought, okay, who would have thought it still burned? So flammability is intensive. Okay, what's another thing you could do? All right, that's still burning, okay. Okay. <coughs> it's all part of the show, people. <laughs> what's um what's another observation I can here how about this what's an observation I can make that is different like you had to describe like go get the one I want and you may be like I don't quite know how to say it but then use the simplest word possible size right could be mass right could be area it could be volume. Like if I fill up a liquid here versus here, won't that change what that measurement is? So like mass and volume would be definitely it. So like mass, volume. Um, I had height, but we don't really measure heights of things. Mass and height. Uh, you can, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff like this. What do I have here? I have nothing apparently. Okay, I have nothing there. Where did I just get rid of it? Oh, hold on, hold on. Right. 
I have a diamond. What do we know about diamonds besides that they're really pretty and they're very valuable? They are very hard, right? The hardness or the density. Would it matter if I had a little chunk or not? It's always going to be the same. So hardness, density, right? Mass, volume, area. And we could go on and on and on. So whenever we ask, is that extensive or intensive? If it, there's this thing called malleability, it's how bendable it is. Well, it's going to be, well, it's actually if you can press it in your sheet, but if it's soft, it's soft. If it's hard, it's hard. It's not like, hey, I got a brick. When I only use a little piece of the brick, it's soft as a pillow. It's like, no, it still would hurt if I threw it at you. And it doesn't matter. Like, oh, I got this pillow, but I'm going to have a huge pillow. Well, that, now it's really hard all of a sudden. It's like, those are things that are different, uh, but they, it doesn't matter how much you have of it. So those are kinds of descriptions that we have. So let's take a look at some homework. So if you get your homework sheet out, this is going to go really quick once you get it going. I get it. This is a sheet you could definitely, definitely just copy off someone. It's not going to help you, and it's not that hard. So go to the back side, please. So letter A. It says water boiling. So whenever you get to something like that, you might need to do this. And I like when I see people do that. Like when you think there's a phase change, you might need to ask yourself. Now maybe in this case it doesn't matter. Because I actually forgot to read what I was looking for. Is this physical or chemical? Physical or chemical. Yes. Physical or chemical. So all I got to do is, is that different? Now people get weird when you talk about gas because you can't see it. But if you're boiling something, like for me, I have a, in my house we have a, a microwave above it. And it always gets just full of, of uh, moisture because the gas is up there and it hits that. By the way, in, the mi uh, in your mirror, in the, mostly in the winter, why is your mirror all foggy? Because when that gas particle is moving really, really fast, and then it hits that cold mirror, uh, then all of a sudden it slows down and it becomes liquid again. And that's why it, it, it's all foggy on your mirror. Um, but in this case, it doesn't even matter that it's a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid or a solid. It doesn't matter as long as I know it's a phase change. So this is a physical change, right? Phase change, physical change. P, P. Uh, uh, physical <coughs> change, right? Phase change. All right, let's go to six. Uh, two of them. And again, a few of these, the problem is you can argue a little. Like, well, but what about this? It's like, then that's great. I understand what you're saying. As long as you are understanding what you are saying, then I understand what you're saying. Uh, copper paint, well, let's do the other one, paint. Is that a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? So I write M or T. So please look so you understand how we're doing this. It should be easy. We're putting an M or T in this problem. The next one we're doing P or C or X and N. Just trying to make it clear. Make it life easy for you. Um, when you buy paint or you have to paint something, you need to stir it, right? There's called paint stir rods. Like they're wood. You stir it. You got to stir it. So if I have to stir it, then it's got to be, is it T? Yeah. It's got to be a heterogeneous mixture then. Okay. Now, please, I'm not setting you up. Like, oh, the other one must be the other thing. No, uh, maybe not. Penny, so we didn't talk about this yet. We will be as we go into this chapter. An alloy is a mixture of metals, so it is a mixture. So this is tricky. Um, if you look at a penny, it looks like all copper. So I'm going to actually try to push you towards, I actually have done a different color. That looks like a big eye instead of a T. Um, that is homogenous. Problem is, I don't know if anybody knows this, and we'll get into it more, and I'm not going to give you all of the, the parts of it. You can look it up if you like. After 1983, or at 1983, they finally figured out, or probably was before it, but that pennies were worth more than a penny. And the treasury was losing a lot of money. So they changed how they made pennies. So the core of the penny is not uh, copper anymore. It's a cheaper metal. Uh, there's some cool things you can do with it. You can etch the sides, put in some acid, and hollow out a penny. You can have a hollow penny. Kind of neat. Uh, but it's not a penny anymore. So if you open it up, then you could argue it's kind of like a Reese's peanut butter cup. It all looks like one. But if you crack it open, there's more inside. But we can just say that's homogenous, but you could argue that. Right? We have three, four, four left. Number eight. Uh, indicate whether each of the following is exo or endo. This matters. I need to know the direction. So frost forming, what state to what state would that be? Like solid, liquid, gas. What is the starting as? Frost forming. Or what is it ending as? Frost ends up as solid, isn't it? So it's liquid. Isn't that like there's like dew on the ground and then it gets too cold and boom, you got some frost, let's say. So am I losing energy or am I gaining energy? Is energy going into the system or is it coming out? So you just got to think about speeds. 
Gas has the most energy, solid has the least. So the direction matters. So I'm going from a liquid to a solid. So if I am going slower, that means I got rid of my energy. I released it. So that's exo. All right. All right, last three. Number nine, boiling point and malleability. I'm um, doing extensive and intensive. So it doesn't matter if you had a little thimble of water. I hope we agree on this, first off, or a bathtub. If I boiled it, would, I, I think our experiences would say that that bathtub would take longer to boil. True? Yes. But at what temperature? If I told you that the thimble is going to boil at 100 degrees, what is the bathtub going to boil at? 100 degrees. It just takes a lot longer because there's a lot more water, right? A lot more. So boiling point, it's the actual point where it boils, like temperature-wise, not time. I'm just forgetting what I'm writing. So it doesn't matter how much you have of it, it's going to boil at that time. So this is an intensive property. Does that make sense? Like melting. It's going to melt or freeze at zero degrees. It might take longer because there's more of it. Malleability is a fancy way of saying that you can take something if it's soft and you can press it into a sheet. Usually people don't think of it that way, so it's more just, is it bendable? Like pirates put the uh, coin in their mouth and then they, they, they bend it to see if it was real gold. So I'm on the internet like three years ago during one of the Olympics and they had a picture of Serena Williams and she's got, she's got her gold medal in her teeth and she's doing this and he said, find out the origin of why uh, all Olympic athletes put the metal in their mouth. So I'm like, ooh, I want to know this. Like, is it is it because in the beginning they did want to test if it was real or not? And it's one of those stupid websites where you have to keep hitting next and next and next as they go through all those images and it just, like at the ending, I'm like, I give up. And at the ending, the answer was, because the photographer asked them to put it in their mouth once. I'm like, I just wasted 20 minutes to find out that? I'm like, thanks. Thanks for that one. Uh, but if it's Bendable or not, let's just call it that for now. It's a good way to just envision it. I'm not going to ruin this. I could, but I won't. So it has a certain amount of strength. This strength now, there's physics involved in this a little bit, but a lot of it, actually. But if I cut this in half, it still more or less has that same idea of how bendable, how malleable it is or not. Mostly if I press down on it. If I had all this and I could press it down versus a little bit, basically the same, right? So malleability is an internal kind of property. So that's an intensive property. So, oh, I got you. You thought you were going to do the other one. So they depend on how much. Just ask yourself this. If you ever get stuck on this, this is the single hardest one for students. Just say this to yourself. If I cut it in half, will it change? You know, like, well, let's do an easy one. What's the first one that comes up that if you cut it in half, it's a new number if you're measuring something? Oh, number one, right, length. If I cut it in half, well, it would be half of the length. Yep. So that's extensive, right? It's a new measurement. It would be different. It changes what it is. It's not like, oh, cut it in half. It's less flammable. No, it still burns. All right, last one, and we are done. 10. And I actually threw this out because I didn't think about it. I've not made Kool-Aid in a very long time. So I'm going to help you out with this. Again, a few of these, if you're like, I don't know because of my life experience, don't let that shake your whole world. My parents don't give me Kool-Aid. I'm going to fail chemistry. Mom, Dad, we need Kool-Aid. We need it now. They told me, and it's like that. Um, if I stir it in, I do have to stir it. So right away, guys, the fact that I have to stir Kool-Aid, this is why I'm doing it, um, element and compound are gone. Right? An element is one element. Compound is uh, two or more elements together, but it's the same thing. But a mixture is when you actually have to mix things together, but they're not bonded. Like, you could separate them easily. So I don't know if you know this. After you mix it all up in your fridge, do you have to shake it or stir it after that? No. You don't. Somebody's like, well, yeah, but you put a ton in there. Then it's never going to go into solution anyway. It's called saturated. Uh, so that uh, is, what's my options? I think M. Is that an option? Yes. OK. So that's what we're doing. Pretty low key, pretty straightforward. You have it until Monday. Last couple items of business. you got four minutes to kind of work if you'd like. Uh, lab sheets are due by tomorrow. Sign them in pen. It says use pen. So we are following uh, how we're going to grade this. You will actually not get as many points if you sign it in pencil. And you're like, that's outrageous. You never sign a contract in pencil. If you ever did that in a job with your boss, 
they're not they're not thinking of you quite as highly because it, it does it's not a good look. I'm telling you now, it's not a good look. It's not a good impression signing something in pencil. I'd rather have to sign in red. Usually you do black or blue or some uh, gel sparkle elf green forest magic pen ink pen. That, that's still better than than a pencil. Uh, lab book money and whatever. If you do not have that in yet, what's your prop? Please get that in. Let me change. If you don't have it in yet, get it in, please. If you have any questions about that, let us know. If you have it now, you can give it to Mr. Keller or Mr. Blackford. They would love to take the money for the purchase that will be uh, 